Chapter 8 Governor Faubus didn't ask for federal troops, but they're up in his face anyhow, Grandma said as we sat watching the arrival of the 101st Airborne Division early Tuesday evening. We were transfixed as we listened to newsmen describe the power of that very special military unit. Fifty-two plane loads, C-123s and C-130s, have brought 1,200 battle-equipped paratroopers to Little Rock to see that integration is carried out at Central High School without further violence. For the first time ever, Grandma had placed dinner on trays in front of the television so we could hear President Eisenhower speak to the nation. Let's put things into perspective. He is our president, and he happens to be talking about us. The whole world's watching. Why shouldn't we? she said. Speaking from the White House, President Eisenhower said he sent troops because mob rule in Little Rock menaces the very safety of the United States and the free world. Later, Governor Faubus came on television to give what one reporter described as a pleading speech. We are now in occupied territory. In the name of God, whom we all revere, in the name of liberty we hold so dear, in the name of decency, which we all cherish, what's happening in America? I can help you figure this out, Mr. Faubus, Mother Lois shouted at the screen. The president has called your bluff. Later that night, as my head was swimming with news reports and questions about whether or not to go back to Central High, I wrote in my diary, Everything in my life is so new. Could I please do some of the old things I know how to do again? I don't know how to go to school with soldiers. Please show me. P.S. Please help the soldiers to keep the mobs away from me. It was very quiet as I turned out the light. With the 101st in town, we didn't hear as many sirens going off. Later, when I woke up thirsty and went to get water, I found Grandma snoring with the rifle lying across her lap. Maybe she felt safer, too. I don't know how long I'd been asleep when I was jolted awake. I sat straight up in bed. The doorbell was ringing, and I heard voices on the front porch. Mama was standing over me. She put her hand over my mouth and motioned me to get up. The doorbell kept ringing over and over again. We moved toward the living room. "'Who is it?' Grandma yelled through the door as she peeked through the covered glass inset. "'White men. It's white men wearing black hats. What are they doing on our front porch at this time of night?' Grandma asked as she picked up the shotgun. Then she shouted through the door again. "'State your business, gentlemen, or I'll be forced to do mine.' "'We're from the office of the President of the United States. "'Please open your door,' they called back. "'We have a message from your President.' "'Grandma opened the door ever so slightly "'and demanded that they show proof of who they were. "'They passed their identification through the half-open door. "'Mother Lois examined the writing closely and nodded a yes. "'How can we help you?' "'Grandma lowered the gun to her side, "'keeping it hidden as she opened the front door a bit more. "'Mother Lois stood beside her. I thought it was funny as I looked around and noticed we were all wearing our nightgowns and pajamas to greet the messengers from the President of the United States. Let your daughter go back to school, and she will be protected, one of the men said, handing Mother Lois an envelope. The next morning, Wednesday, September 25th, at 8 a.m., as we turned the corner near the Bates's home, I saw them, about 50 uniformed soldiers of the 101st. Some stood tall with their rifles at their sides, while others manned the jeeps parked at the curb. Still other soldiers walked about holding walkie-talkies to their ears. As I drew nearer to them, I was fascinated by their well-shined boots. Grandma had always said that well-kept shoes were the mark of a disciplined individual. Their guns were also glistening, as though they had been polished, and the creases were sharp in the pant legs of their uniforms. I had heard all those newsmen say, Screaming Eagle Division of the 101st. But those were just words. I was seeing human beings, flesh and blood men, with eyes that looked back at me. They resembled the men I'd seen in army pictures on TV and on the movie screen. Their faces were white, their expressions blank. There were lots of people of both races standing around, talking to one another in whispers. I recognized some of the ministers from our churches. Several of them nodded or smiled at me. I was a little concerned because many people, even those who knew me well, were staring as though I were different from them. Thelma and Minnie Jean stood together, inspecting the soldiers close up, while the other students milled about. I wondered what we were waiting for. 
I was told there was an assembly at Central, with the military briefing the students. Reporters hung from trees, perched on fences, stood on cars, and darted about with their usual urgency. Cameras were flashing on all sides. There was an eerie hush over the crowd, not unlike the day I'd seen folks behave outside the home of the deceased just before a funeral. There were tears in Mother's eyes as she whispered goodbye. Make this the best you can, she said. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. One of our ministers stepping from among the others and began to say comforting words. I noticed tears were streaming down the faces of many of the adults. I wondered why they were crying just at that moment when I had more hope of staying alive and keeping safe than I had since the integration began. Protect these youngsters and bring them home. Flood the Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of those who would attack our children. Yes, Lord, several voices echoed. One of the soldiers stepped forward and beckoned the driver of a station wagon to move it closer to the driveway. Two jeeps moved forward, one in front of the station wagon and one behind. Guns were mounted on the hoods of the jeeps. We were already a half hour late for school when we heard the order, move out, and the leader motioned us to get into the station wagon. As we collected ourselves and walked toward the caravan, many of the adults were crying openly. When I turned to wave to Mother Lois, I saw tears streaming down her cheeks. I couldn't go back to comfort her. Sarge, our driver, was friendly and pleasant. He had a southern accent, different from ours, different even from the one Arkansas Whites had. We rolled away from the curb lined with people waving to us. Mama looked even more distraught. I remembered I hadn't kissed her goodbye. Our convoy moved through the streets lined with people on both sides, who stood as though they were waiting for a parade. A few friendly folks from our community waved as we passed by. Some of the white people looked totally horrified, while others raised their fists to us. Others shouted ugly words. We pulled up to the front of the school. Groups of soldiers on guard were lined at intervals several feet apart. A group of twenty or more was running at breakneck speed up and down the street in front of Central High School, their rifles with bayonets pointed straight ahead. Sarge said they were doing crowd control, keeping the mob away from us. About twenty soldiers moved toward us, forming an olive-drab square with one end open. I glanced at the faces of my friends. Like me, they appeared to be impressed by the imposing sight of military power. There was so much to see, and everything was happening so quickly. We walked through the open end of the square. Erect, rifles at their sides, their faces stern, the soldiers did not make eye contact as they surrounded us in a protective cocoon. After a long moment, the leader motioned us to move forward. I felt proud and sad at the same time. Proud that I lived in a country that would go this far to bring justice to a little rock girl like me but sad that they had to go to such great lengths. Yes, this is the United States, I thought to myself. There is a reason I salute the flag. If these guys just go with us the first time, everything's going to be okay. We began moving forward. The eerie silence of that moment would forever be etched in my memory. All I could hear was my own heartbeat and the sound of boots clicking on the stone. Everyone seemed to be moving in slow motion as I peered past the raised bayonets of the 101st soldiers. I walked on the concrete path toward the front door of the school, the same path the Arkansas National Guard had blocked us from days before. We approached the stairs, our feet moving in unison to the rhythm of the marching click-clack sound of the screaming eagles. Step by step, we climbed upward, where none of my people had ever before walked as a student. We stepped up to the front door of Central High School and crossed the threshold into that place where angry segregationist mobs had forbidden us to go. Once the Screaming Eagles had delivered us safely inside the front door of Central High School, all of us, the soldiers, we night students, white school officials, were standing absolutely still, as though under a spell. No one seemed to know what to do next. The commander of the troops spoke a few words, and our military protectors fell into formation and marched away. I felt naked without that blanket of safety. A warning alarm surged through my body. Principal Jess Matthews greeted us with a forced smile on his face and directed us to our classrooms. 
It was then that I saw the other group of soldiers. They were wearing a different uniform from the combat soldiers outside, but they carried the same hardware and had the same placid expressions. As the nine of us turned to go our separate ways, one by one a soldier followed each of us. Along the winding hallway near the door we had entered, I passed several clusters of students who stared at me, whispered obscenities, and pointed. They hurled insults at the soldier as well, but he seemed not to pay attention. My class was more than a block away from the front door, near the 14th Street entry to the school. I saw other 101st soldiers standing at intervals along the hall. I turned back to make sure there really was a soldier following me, and he was there all right. As I approached the classroom, he speeded up, coming closer to me. Melba, my name is Danny. He looked me directly in the eye. He was slight of build, about five feet ten inches tall, with dark hair and deep-set brown eyes. I'll be waiting for you here. We're not allowed to go inside the classrooms. If you need me, holler. My heart skipped a beat as the classroom door closed behind me. I looked back once more and saw Danny's eyes peering through the square glass inset in the door. The teacher beckoned me to take a seat near the door, where I was in full view of the soldier. I was one of about twenty students. "'You all just gonna sit still and let this come in here like this? I'm leaving. Who's coming with me?' A tall, dark-haired boy paused for a moment, looking around the room. At first, there was silence, but no one left. I took my seat, hoping to settle down and focus on the classwork. Sunlight flooded into the room through a full bank of windows along the far wall. It was a beautiful morning. I tried hard to concentrate, turning myself into what the teacher was saying as she continued her discussion of diagramming sentences. What a stroke of luck. Mother had played a game with Conrad and me, teaching us diagramming at an early age. It's convenient to have a mom who is an English teacher. You ugly... Think just because you got those army boys following you around, you gonna get to stay here. I swallowed a sadness lump in the back of my throat. I wondered whether or not I should press the teacher to stop the boy from treating me that way. I decided against it, because I thought she must be well aware of what he was doing. Besides, we had been instructed not to make a big deal of reporting things in front of other students, lest we be labeled tattletales. The boy continued his taunting throughout the period. At the end of class, I spoke to the teacher to get a list of back assignments, and during the conversation, I asked if she could do something to calm people down. I hope you don't think we're going to browbeat our students to please you all, she said. I pushed down my anger and walked out. When I entered Mrs. Pickwick's shorthand class, things improved decidedly. It was like being on a peaceful island. She remained ever in control. There were a few whispered nasty remarks, but no outbursts. Her no-nonsense attitude didn't leave room for unruly behavior. En route to the next class, I had to use the restroom. I had put it off for as long as I could. I had hoped I could put it off until I went home. It was what I dreaded most because the girls' restrooms were so isolated. Danny leaned against the wall, across from the bathroom door, quite a distance away. I hurried inside. The students appeared astonished at the sight of me. "'There ain't no sign marked colored on this door, girl,' one of them said as I whizzed past. I couldn't respond or even stop to listen to her. I was desperate to find an empty stall. Once inside, with the door closed, I felt alarmed at their whispering and scrambling about, but I couldn't make out exactly what they were saying." I ran out like a shot, pausing only a second to get a few drops of water to clean my hands. And that's when I noticed it. Written all over the mirror, with lipstick, was... Go home. Later that day, I hesitated as the throng of students made its way back up the front staircase. When the bottom of the stairway had cleared, Danny motioned me to move ahead. By then I was anxious to go to the cafeteria... I was looking forward to being with my friends, with people I could talk to and laugh with, but Danny said we had been summoned to the vice principal's office. He walked only a few steps behind me as I moved cautiously through the clogged hallway, avoiding close encounters with hecklers wherever I could. 
We moved up to the second floor and into the office, where I was met by Carlotta, Thelma, and Mrs. Huckabee, the girl's vice principal. She insisted on escorting us to the restroom and the cafeteria, and we thanked her. The four of us walked to the lower level and into a wider hallway, a brightly lit area of what appeared to be a basement corridor leading to the biggest cafeteria I had ever seen. The cafeteria seemed to be half the size of a football field, filled with long tables. There was a roar of noise from the hundreds of chatting, laughing students and the clang of utensils. The line of people waiting to pick up their food appeared to go on forever. Many of the students in that room turned to stare at us. All at once, I caught a glimpse of non-white faces, my people serving food behind the counter. I didn't feel the same twinge of painful embarrassment I sometimes felt when I saw my people in service positions in public places. Instead, I was thrilled to see them smiling back at me. The cafeteria line was treacherous, but I survived with my tray of food intact. Over lunch, Carlotta, Thelma, and I were joined by a couple of friendly white girls. For a brief moment, we laughed and talked about ordinary things, as though it were a typical school day. Indeed, a few white students were trying to reach out to us. They explained that many of their friends would stay away because they feared segregationists who warned them against any show of kindness toward us. After lunch, as I headed for gym class, I had two more reasons to hope integration would work. Amid all the hecklers taunting me, two girls had smiled and waved a welcome. Danny and I parted company at the door that led to the girls' dressing room. We agreed to meet after I changed into my gym uniform. He would wait near the head of the narrow corridor that led to the gym class. I was frightened as I looked down at the bandage on my knee from the last time I had walked those isolated corridors to gym class. I got out of there as fast as I could. I entered the dressing room and changed my clothing, going about my business briskly, even when someone tried to block my way. The stairs and name-calling hurt, but I was growing accustomed to coping with it. With surprising speed, I changed into my uniform and was on my way out to meet Danny. He pointed me toward the concrete stairs that led down to the first-level playing field. Several hundred yards beneath us, on what had been an enormous playing field, there was now a huge city. Hundreds of olive drab tents stood in meticulous rows. There were jeeps and larger trucks with tarpaulins. It was an absolute beehive of activity. Several soldiers were posted directly below us in the field where my class would be. The sight of pristine lines of marching soldiers going back and forth in the distance calmed my nerves. When class ended, I played a game with myself. I would earn a world record for getting dressed at the fastest speed known to mankind. When Danny greeted me, he confirmed I had far exceeded his expectations. As he trailed me through an isolated passage to the open hallway, we were confronted by a chorus of chants from sideburners. Copying their hairstyle from James Dean and Elvis, they fancied themselves to be bad boys. Hut! One, two, three, march! March, company! March to the beat of the drum! The choir of boys chanted as we walked past. Suddenly, one of them came up to me and slammed my books out of my hand onto the floor. We were surrounded by thugs, many much bigger than Danny. Don't move, Danny whispered. Stand absolutely still. His words stopped me from running for my life. At that moment, it was hard to remain still. My knees were shaking as the group closed in on us. All at once, from nowhere, other soldiers appeared and made their presence known by holding on to their nightsticks and moving toward us slowly. I wondered where they had come from so quickly. Then I looked behind me, and there were still more, standing against the walls, erect and silent, as though steeled to go into action at any moment. Reluctantly, the hooligans dispersed, leaving a trail of insults in their wake. The soldiers withdrew as quickly and quietly as they had appeared, out of sight, in an instant. There were no harsh greetings or hecklings as I entered French class. In fact, some of the students wore pleasant expressions. It took me a while to realize that they had a different kind of unwelcome mat for me. I was excited about French class. Mother Lois spoke fluent French. She often gave Conrad and me lessons over the dinner table. 
I was anxious to get started because I could see that Central had tape recorders and special headphones, things I hadn't had in my French class before. The students spent the entire hour speaking in French about sun tanning. I understood the language, and I didn't know what to do as one student spoke in French about not wanting to get too dark, for fear of being taken for a, um, well, you know, a... I blinked back tears of disappointment. A serious headache was overtaking me by the time I headed for study hall, with Danny tagging behind. Entering the door was like walking into a zoo with the animals outside their cages. The room was double the size of the largest classroom in my old school. I'd never seen anything like it or imagined in my wildest dreams that an important school like Central would allow such outrageous behavior. Stomping, walking, shouting, sailing paper airplanes through the air, students milling about as though they were having a wild party. The teacher sat meekly behind his desk, a spectator stripped of the desire and power to make them behave. I took five steps into the room, and everybody fell silent, abandoning their activities to glare at me. Take that seat over there, the study hall teacher said. But I need... I wanted to ask him for a seat near the door where I could see Danny, but he cut me off. Did you hear me? I said take the seat over there or see the principal. The teacher returned to reading his newspaper while the students threw spitballs. They directed only a few at me. Mostly they were involved in their own little games. At one point they started passing notes back and forth. When one was passed to me, I opened it. Go home, it read. I looked at it without emotion, folded it neatly, and put it aside. The helicopters are coming to pick up the... Someone shouted. Thank God, I thought. I had lived through the wildest hour where nobody did anything major to me, but their threats, near misses, flying paper airplanes and pencils had shattered my nerves. Helicopters. Home, I whispered. It seemed like a lifetime since I had been home and comfortable and safe. Just then Danny opened the door and beckoned to me. Let's move out for home, he said. The engine of the helicopter roared louder as we descended the stairs. Protected by the mighty power of the screaming eagles, we walked to the army staff car waiting at the curb. As I stepped into it, a wave of peace washed over me. Relax, we're on the move, Sarge, our driver, said, as we snuggled down into our seats. The convoy was the same as it had been that morning. In front, the open jeep filled with soldiers, a machine gun mounted on its hood, with a similar vehicle behind us. As we pulled away from Central High, I looked back to see students gathered on the school lawn, staring at us as though they were watching a parade they hadn't known was coming their way. For just one tiny instant, I even felt a twinge of sympathy for them. "'You all have a good day, did you?' Sarge said, making polite conversation." We all gave our different versions of the same answer. Good isn't exactly the word to describe my day. All right. Depends on what you mean by good. My mama never told me there'd be days like this one. That was the beginning of a funny round robin to see who could describe his or her, her experience in the most colorful language. The ride home brought the joyful relief I had awaited all day. At times, our stories halted all laughter as we noticed someone's eyes filled with tears. There were tales of flying books and pencils and words that pierced the soul. But there were also descriptions of polite students who volunteered to sit beside us, or offered to lend back homework assignments, or flashed a warm smile just when we needed it most. Our respite was over all too soon. As we approached Mrs. Bates's home, I saw news reporters. My headache started up again. The cameras began to flash even before Sarge could get the car parked. We said our thank yous to him and turned to face the bombardment of questions as we made our way to Mrs. Bates's front door. What was it like inside the school? Were you frightened? How are you treated? Did anybody hit you? Did they call you names? What classes are you taking? Over and over again, the same questions. Then there was one that stuck in my mind and made me tighten my jaw. Are you going back tomorrow? I wasn't ready to think of another tomorrow at Central High. 
I sat quietly and pondered the question as I glanced out the front window at the few soldiers standing at attention. But they were there for only a brief moment before they climbed into the jeeps and the station wagon and rolled away. And then my attention was quickly brought back inside by the rude question being asked. Would you like to be white? I scowled at the reporter, and he must have understood my irritation. Uh, I mean, does all this trouble make you all wish that you were white instead of negro? He amended his question. Do you wish you were negro? I heard the angry words roll out of my mouth. I'm proud of who I am. My color is inconvenient right now, but it won't always be like this. I'd said what I felt, despite the fear that it would be considered talking back to an adult. Can you write as well as you can speak? A slender, dark-haired man asked. I don't know, I answered. Why don't you try it? I'm Stan Apatowiski of the New York Post, and this is Ted Poston. Here's my card. I would like you to write what you're thinking, and I'll see to it that it's printed. I looked at them. Poston was the same race as me. Yeah, sure, I can try. I took the card from him. I told myself I owed him a favor. If reporters hadn't been covering our story, we might have been hanged. News of our demise would be a three-line notation buried on the back page of a white newspaper, were it not for the northern reporters' nosy persistence in getting the facts and dogging the trail of segregationists. We're off to the Dunbar Community Center for another news conference. I couldn't believe my ears, but off we went, once more answering questions in a more formal setting. As we rode home, I looked forward to shedding my day like soiled clothing. But the first thing I saw as I rounded the corner to my house was reporters sitting in the green lawn chairs on my front porch, holding cameras and notebooks, and a few neighbors gathered in front of my house talking to them. I can't face them, I thought to myself. But I did. I got through it. I smiled. I said the right things. I pretended to be interested in the questions. By 9 p.m., I was so tired that I only wanted my pillow and dreams. Sweet, happy dreams with no white people and no central high. The next thing I heard was the song on my radio as the alarm went off, waking me out of a cold, sweaty dream. Peggy! Peggy Sue, Buddy Holly was singing. I picked up my diary and started to write. It's Thursday, September 26th, 1957. Now I have a bodyguard. I know very well that the president didn't send those soldiers just to protect me, but to show support for an idea. The idea that a governor can't ignore federal laws. Still, I feel specially cared about because the guard is there. If he wasn't there, I'd hear more of the voices of those people who say I'm a... that I'm not valuable, that I have no right to be alive. Thank you, Danny. <laughs>